So, number one. Here it says, ask me to find the exact value without using a calculator and to use identities rather than a reference triangle. So, I'm my goal here, if I'm doing this as follows directions, is to not have to draw an xy axis. I don't want to think about what quadrant things are positive or negative in. I don't want to do any of that kind of stuff. I just want to try to use the identities based on the directions. Now this problem is entirely doable using reference triangles and quadrants and thinking about where things are positive and negative. And I think the next block of questions ask you, or say you can do either and we'll do some reference triangle things in that section to kind of refresh our memory on how you can do that. But here I want to just try to use an identity. So there's two things that I know about. I know about cosines and I know about tangents. Right? We're given some information about both of them. What I want to do is find a Pythagorean identity that's going to relate both of them together. So typically, on these kinds of problems, I'm going to start with one of the Pythagorean identities. So if you have your notes with you, I would look at my notes and look at my identities lists while we're going through this, because again, it's just helping you familiarize yourself with these identities, figuring out the kinds of things they allow us to do. So if you look at your list of identities while we're doing these, I think that's going to be helpful. If I look at my three Pythagorean identities, which one of those three appears to be the most useful to us in this situation? I would say P3. And I have, I have a couple of these identity sheets left here. If you don't need one, need one, just take it and pass. There's only like this. this morning because I got bombarded by like four kids coming in and asking for help and I didn't get a chance to print the things that I wanted to. Uh, but if you can get by without one, like you have all your notes and they're complete or whatever, if you don't need one, like don't take one right now. This is also on the Power School page, this identity sheet. Um, just FYI, right? Did you guys notice that? If you look at the Chapter 5 materials, this sheet is in there, in addition to the lessons and the problems and the odd solutions. So this sheet is there also. Um, and if you haven't printed one yet, um, you know, if you didn't get one today, please, please do that. Okay. So P3 is the one that I would use. Yeah, so why am I using P3 is a good question. Well, one of the reasons is that it involves tangent, and that's one of the two things I know information about, right? The other thing that I know information about is cosine, and how is cosine related to secant? They are, we would use the word reciprocal rather than inverse because we don't want to get confused with like, the inverse trig functions, which are not reciprocals, to be clear. Um, so if cosine is one-fourth, I know that secant then is four. So that's how I that's why I picked this one, because it involved both cosine and tangent together in the same one. Um, in particularly, this is going to allow me to like nail down the exact value for tangent, which will be, I'm going to need in order to find that exact value for sine. Everybody okay with that idea? So then if I plug in 4 into secant squared, I'd have tan squared theta plus 1 is equal to 4 squared, or that tan theta is plus or minus the square root of 15. I skipped some steps there, but they're just like basic solving things, right? 
4 squared is 16, minus 1 from both sides gives me 15, and then square root both sides gives me the plus or minus square root of 15. So if I look at on my identity sheet or my identities list, if I look at the reciprocal identities, I know that secant is equal to 1 over cosine. So if cosine is 1 fourth, secant is 4. It's reciprocal. All right, and now since I know that tangent is negative, what can I say about this plus or minus? It's just a minus. Okay. Now that I know specifically what tangent is, I'm going to look through my identity list and find an identity that relates now sine, cosine, and tangent together. Good. So if I look at the quotient identities, if I look at Q1, I know that tangent theta is equal to sine theta over cosine theta, right? If I multiply both sides by, sides by cosine, I have cosine theta times tan theta is equal to sine theta. <laughs> I know the exact value of cosine is one-fourth, and the exact value of tangent is negative square root 15. So my exact value of sine is negative square root 15 all over 4. So doing this, I used three identities, right? I used one of them to rewrite cosine as a secant. I used P3, and then I used Q1, right? This was, what did I say here? This is R5, P3, and Q2. These are just labeled as they are on the identity sheet. That's where I'm getting these labels from. If you didn't get an identity sheet or haven't looked at that yet, that's all I'm doing with these labels. Okay, You do not need to label them as such. I'm just doing it to communicate better with you guys. Is that okay? okay. Let's look at two. Let's try to use the same reasoning on number two. Which identity would I choose to use first? So by the second one you mean P2, right? And the reason we're choosing that is because it's going to relate cosecant and cotangent together. Uh, I can say 1 plus cotangent. I guess these are alphas. It doesn't really matter to me. Uh, equals cosecant squared alpha. So I know that cosecant alpha is equal to negative 3. So if I solve then, I get that cotangent alpha is equal to plus or minus the square root of 8, which is 
I'm going to write as 2 root 2. So I did a bunch of simplifying there, but it's, you know, like your basic run-of-the-mill solving and simplifying. I'm sure if you don't see how I got there, if you wrote out the steps in a second, you would be like, oh, okay. Yep. No big deal. And because cotangent is positive, this plus or minus is really just positive, right? Okay. So far, so good. Now I'm going to look for an identity that relates secant, cosecant, and cotangent, all three of them together. That looks like Q2. Everybody notice that the second version of Q2 has that. So if I want to get secant by itself, I'll multiply both sides by secant. And then divide by cotangent. And now I'll plug in my values. So cosecant is negative 3 and cotangent is 2 root 2. And then I'd want to make sure I rationalize my denominator. So there I would have to multiply by the square root of 2 to the top and bottom, giving me negative 3 root 2 all over 4. And that's going to be my final. that feel a little bit more manageable there? The reasoning of how we choosing these identities feeling a little bit better? Even if it's not a ton, I'll settle for a little bit. All right. Uh, let's do three. Let's do three, though, using the reference triangle just to kind of contrast the difference here. We can do the same thing with an identity, but... So, if I'm going to use reference triangles, I'm going to start by drawing my xy axis and labeling all silly turtles crawl. So I'm going to start with that cosine is positive, so if cosine is positive, I know that I'm working out of these two quadrants. Everybody agree with that? Since cotangent is negative, cotangent is negative the same place as tangent would be negative. So I'd be working out of this quadrant or this quadrant. Everybody agree with that? Well, what quadrant is my triangle in? Definitely in the fourth quadrant, right? So I'm going to draw my reference triangle here. Notice that I'm drawing my reference triangle so that one side of it is on the x-axis. I always draw my reference triangle so that one side of it is on the x-axis. I'm never drawing it so that one side of it is on the y-axis. Always the x. So there's my angle theta. Now if I use the definition of cosine, I know cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So this side is 3 and that side is 4. 
Furthermore, I can then use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out what that third side is. So this side is going to be the square root of 7. And because of we're in quadrant 4, and this is describing like a vertical component, what should the sine on square root of 7 be? It should be negative. Now I have everything I need to figure out the values of the other um, five trig identities, or, or trig uh, functions. So we have cosine already. If I want sine theta, that's going to be the opposite over the hypotenuse. Tangent theta will be opposite over adjacent cosecant uh, would be hypotenuse over opposite and when I rationalize that denominator I get that secant is just the reciprocal of cosine or you could think of it as hypotenuse over adjacent and cotangent is just the reciprocal of tangent, or you could think about it as adjacent over opposite, which again, when I rationalize that denominator, would give me this. Everybody okay with how I did that using a reference triangle? It was pretty easy to do using a reference triangle, right? Let's do it using an identity also. So I'm going to start by just erasing the graph part because I figure by now everybody's, if you were copying anything down, you've got that copy down and maybe you're still working on writing that other list of functions. But I can start on the uh, doing this with an identity. All right. So in general, on these identity problems, my goal is to figure out the values for sine and cosine. If I know the values of sine and cosine, I can get all the other trig functions from that. Because if I look at the reciprocal and quotient identities, I can relate every trig function to something in terms of sine and cosine. Everybody okay with that reasoning? Okay. So I'm going to start just like I've had before. I'm going to look at cosine and cotangent and look for a, um, a, uh, a Pythagorean that relates the two of those at least kind of. I would settle with P3. Because I can think of cosine is equal to 3 fourths as secant is equal to 4 thirds. And cotangent less than zero or less than zero is the same as tangent less than zero. Since tangent and cotangent are reciprocals. If one is negative, the reciprocal is negative, right? So I'll write then tangent squared theta plus one equals secant squared. So if I plug in four thirds for secant, I get 16 ninths. And when I subtract 1 from both sides, I would have made a common denominator. That would give me 7 ninths. And when I square root both sides, I get plus or minus square root 7 over 3. And 
because tangent is negative, I know it's just really negative. Square root 7 over 3. Everybody okay with that? I'm just boxing my answers as I go. Notice that I'm picking up answers just kind of all the time along the way. I know that is since I know tangent, I also know cotangent because they're just reciprocals. And I notice here that I have to rationalize that denominator. So that picks me up a fourth answer along the way. All that I'm left with now is to get sine and cosecant together, right? Everybody agree with that? Okay. To do that, I'm going to use the identity uh, Q1 that says tangent is equal to sine over cosine because I know tangent and I know cosine, so I can in depth or absolutely find sine. And then once I have sine, I can get cosecant pretty easily. So to solve for sine, I'll just multiply both sides by cosine. So that's going to be 3 fourths times negative 7, or I'm sorry, negative root 7 over 3. And the threes are going to cancel. So I'm going to left with negative root 7 over 4. So there's my value for sine. And then using my reciprocal identity, I know that cosecant is going to be negative 4 over square root 7. Or when I rationalize negative 4 root 7 over 7. And that's my last one. Michael? Sure. Now you didn't have to do this problem both ways. Notice it says or here. So either approach would have been fine. Um, in general, I think that the reference triangle is probably a little easier or a little less writing anyways but you could certainly do the same thing with um, identities, right? We've just shown that that's possible. The problem that really becomes, um, I think, nice example as to the power of using an identity is 6. So let's skip down to 6. So I'm going to approach this using identities, and I'll show you what we'd have to do to use reference triangles on this one, but it's a little bit weird. So right away, I know that secant is 1. And because of that, I also know cosine, right? Cosine is also going to be 1 because the reciprocal of 1 is just 1 still. Everybody's okay with that? So here I have that cotangent theta is equal to undefined. So what do we mean by undefined? Yeah, it means it's going to be something over 0. So if I take the reciprocal then of that, I have tangent is going to be 0 over 1, or just 0. Everybody okay there? Okay. And then since I know that tan theta is equal to sine over cosine, 
if I multiply both sides by cosine, I have 1 times 0 is equal to sine. So that gives me that sine theta is 0. And last thing I need is cosecant. Cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. So the reciprocal of 0 is like 1 over 0, which is undefined. that one is actually pretty easy to get any to, to do right that wasn't so bad using the identities I didn't have to touch any of the Pythagoreans I did this all just with like the reciprocals now if I tried to do this on the unit circle or on with a reference triangle secant is um, hypotenuse over adjacent. Now is that possible to have a triangle whose hypotenuse is the same length as one of its sides? I'm sorry, a right triangle? That is literally impossible. What this is instead saying is that we're on the unit circle And we're at this point, 1, 0. The only point on the unit circle where this is um, secant, instead of thinking about it as hypotenuse over adjacent, I'm going to think about it as 1 over x, which is what the unit circle definition of this is. And if this is 1, that tells me then that x is equal to 1. And the only place on the unit circle where x is equal to 1 is that point there at 1, 0. From that, I can use my unit circle definitions of sine, cosine, tangent, etc. to finish this out, right? Yeah, of course. It did. It was easier than it looked, but if you didn't know what to do with stuff, like that's one you could have looked at for a long time because there's no triangle possible to draw it here. You had to go use the unit circle definition, which might not have been super obvious. Everybody okay with that idea? Uh, we ready to start talking about the simplify ones? So hopefully we've done enough of those previous ones to let you, if you had a hard time with that part of the homework, should have enough insight now to at least be ready to try some more on your own, right? Even if you're not getting them right still, you should be able to make better progress than you probably did before when you're like, felt totally underwater, right? You at least got like a straw above water that you're pulling some air in. Yeah. All right. Um, so if I look at number seven, I'm going to, when we do these simplify problems, I'm either going to use like some algebra technique, like factoring or foiling or expanding or reducing or making a common denominator, or div dividing fractions, or something like that, or I'm going to use one of the identities. Here it should be pretty obvious that there's no algebra to do since you just have one thing times another thing, right? So I'm going to be using an identity. From my identity list, where are places that I can't, are not going to be helpful to me for this problem? The odd evens useless to me because there's no negative signs anywhere in this, right? Okay, what next? What else is worthless to me here? 
the co-function identities are worthless to me, right? Do you see pi over 2 floating around in either one of these places? Nah. Also worthless to me, the Pythagorean identities. I don't have anything that's squared anywhere in here. I don't have a 1 anywhere in here. So I'm either going to be focusing on the reciprocal or the quotient identities. So Miguel says the quotient identity. Specifically, which one of the quotient identities would you be interested in? Yeah, Q2. Because that's going to really, or enable me to rewrite cotangent so that it has a sign in it. Oops, I guess we're using U's here. Yeah, I'm not going to, I wouldn't be too picky about that. So we use Q2 here. And I'll write those for now like what identity we use to do the simplifying or whatever above the equal sign. Mostly just to communicate to you guys. Um, I would not require you to do that, but if it helps you, feel free. Um, I think often on the homework, while you guys are learning the identities, I think it's a really useful thing to do because I think it just helps you learn the identities a little better and think about what identity you're using where. And I would encourage you to do that, but I wouldn't make a deduction on a test or a quiz or whatever if you failed to do that. Sure. Michael? I used Q2. Uh, how about cosine over sine? Is the version that I used because I already had another sign in my problem. Okay. One. Right? I can write anything over one. Just so it's so it's easy for me to multiply the fractions. Because that's what we're gonna do next. It's just some algebra stuff, right? What can happen here? I can just reduce the fraction. And this is as good as we can do because it's down to a single trig function. Everybody okay on that one? I'll make these a little bigger. Ooh. Let's look at number eight. Something should stand out at us right away in number eight. Yeah, does everybody see the pi over two floating around in there? Where am I going to need to use assuredly here? One of the co-function identity. Which one would I want to use? Uh, not C6, right? What now? I notice an algebra thing that I can do right away. Ben? Notice I have a cosecant on top and a cosecant squared on bottom, right? I'll just do a little reducing. Everybody okay to there? What would you like to do next? So Valerie says she's going to use Q2 on the top. 
and you're going to use R4 on the bottom. Okay. That's fine. I'll come back to this though. Cosine x over sine x over 1 over sine x. Now this is just the division of two fractions, right? So to divide fractions, we can multiply by the reciprocals. So if I reduce again, I'm left with cosine and because it's a single trig function, I know I'm done. Are we okay on that one? Have I lost anybody any place? We need to talk about decision making or why we didn't do something that you thought you might have wanted to do. Uh, so at this step, you could have done the other version of Q2, and you would have been left with like 1 over secant, which you could have then written as cosine. So that's also possible. So just as an aside, if you did the other version of Q2, here we can reduce, and we're left with 1 over secant. And I know that that is using R2, the same thing as cosine. So that's a little bit quicker to do it that way, but only marginally, right? It just saved a little bit of algebra, but not so bad. Everybody see the alternate path there? That, okay. uh, let's look at 9. Woo. Let's talk about the set kinds of identities that aren't going to be helpful to us. What are some of these classes of identities that would not be helpful right now? The reciprocal ones, right? Because we have stuff already, just sines and cosines. It's unlikely you'd want to turn the sine into, some, into a fraction or the cosine into a fraction. Fractions inside of fractions are usually not going to be super helpful to us. Okay, what else? The quotient ones, because we don't have tangent or cotangent anywhere. Good. What else? Co-function and odd and even runs, right? Here we're almost assuredly going to need to use one of the Pythagoreans. Which of the Pythagoreans would be best to use here? Val? The first one. And now we can think of using the first one two different ways. So one way we can do it is we can replace one with sine squared plus cosine squared. And a plus cosine and a minus cosine just going to cancel out. 
then we can reduce and we're left with sum. The other option, or the other way of using P1, is we know that sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to 1. So if I subtract cosine squared from both sides, I know that sine squared is 1 minus cosine squared, right? So if I use that version, I can reduce and just have sine left. Either way of approaching this is fine. Notice in the green we had to alter one of these Pythagoreans. So we use like P1 star or something, like a rearranged version of P1 but that's fine. You could do that. Ben? So, on the, you're talking about in black on the first step? So here, I did that substitution. I know that 1 is equal to sine squared plus cosine squared. So I just replaced the 1 there. This part is still left there. No problem. That wasn't super obvious. Um, but either way of kind of thinking about that is fine. You notice that they're basically the same regardless of how you do it, right? Whether you want to do your work as rearranging or you want to do your work like canceling the positive and negative. Either way. Abby? Of course. Let's take a look at 10. 10 can be very easy if you do the right thing first. If you don't do the right thing first, 10 can take a long time. What do you guys want to do first here on 10? Ben? Okay. What do you want to substitute? You could make a common denominator, okay? You could s rewrite everything in terms of sine and cosine. You ready to hear the, see the trick to make this like two steps? Because all of these things you're suggesting are going to take a while. When I look at this, I notice that there's a greatest common factor here. What's the greatest common factor? tangent. Now do you see why this is going to go quickly? If I use uh, R, uh, R1 and R2, that's going to turn 1 over cosecant squared into just sine squared and secant squared into, or 1 over secant squared into cosine squared which is, and I know that that part is just 1. Using P1 
and you're left with just tangent. Right? How slick was that move? When we did this, when we did this during first hour, I didn't get. Ha I was halfway through, and then I saw it. I'm like, oh boy, this would have been a lot easier. Sam, yes. Okay. So, if you had um, the likely the likely instinct for you guys, though, would not have been to do that, right? Let's do this problem again, doing a more common route. So probably the most common thing to have done here would be to use like four identities here, right, or three identities here in the first step and rewrite everything in terms of sine and cosine. Yeah, so you could use like R4, R5, and Q1. Okay, there. And if we divide fractions, We have this. Everybody okay there? Now notice it might be tempting over here to reduce, right? You can see that there is reducing that's possible there. I would not do that. Why would reducing at this step be a bad idea? Look right now, we have a common denominator, right? If I reduce, I'm going to lose the common denominator. Why would I reduce then? You know what I mean, guys? So I have sine cubed plus sine x cosine squared x all over cosine x. If I look in the numerator, I see a greatest common factor of sine. And here's our Pythagorean that we saw just like in the previous one. And then using Q1, we can make that tangent. Notice this is still basically the same thing as what we did in the previous but we cut out turning tangent to sines and cosines and turning it back into tangent again. But I don't know that it would have been super obvious. It wasn't super obvious to me looking at this problem, the quickest way to do that one. But notice that even though we did something different, we still did things that are okay. We didn't violate any algebra rules. We eventually ended up kind of at the same spot. So... I think we're probably five minutes. What do you want to try to do one more? No. No? Okay, good. I don't want to either. <laughs>